good afternoon and good evening to all our viewers who have joined from different parts of the world welcome to the ninth session of apcr shr 10 virtual the ongoing virtual series of the 10th asia pacific conference on reproductive and sexual health and rights co-hosted by apcr shr 10 reproductive health association of cambodia and cns this virtual conference features 14 online thematic sessions spread over june to december 2020 with plenary speakers and top ranking abstract presenters sharing their insights around sexual and reproductive health and rights and sustainable development goals in the asia pacific regional context these sessions are also streamed live on the facebook pages of APCR SHR 10 and CNS. Today's session is on humanitarian response and sexual and reproductive health and rights in Asia Pacific. Just a few quick housekeeping announcements for our viewers before I hand over the mic to our chairperson for today. My humble request to all the presenters to please adhere to your allotted time there will be a prompt from the chairperson two minutes before your scheduled time ends. Audience, please keep yourself muted and your videos turned off throughout the session. Presenters are also requested to mute themselves when not speaking. There will be a question and answer open session after all the speakers have presented. Those who are using Zoom platform, can type in their comments and questions in the chat box. And you can do that even as speakers present and not wait till the end. If you are watching it on Facebook Live, you can type in your question in the comment box. And in the interest of time, please keep your questions and comments brief and precise. Also, as we know, we are living in difficult times and most of us are working from home. So please bear with us and bear with each other in case of any technical glitches that may arise out of poor internet connectivity. I now hand over the mic to our chairperson, Chonhee Wang. Chonhee is Senior Manager with Family Planning 2020, or what we call FP 2020 Secretariat, and plays a key role in executing FP 2020's strategic approach for Asia supporting coordination and problem solving at the country and regional level with the goal of enhancing the reproductive health and rights of women and girls. She is a former director of the Korea Foundation for International Healthcare and policy analyst at Korea International Cooperation Agency. Chonhee has also served as program officer at the Reproductive Health Division of United Nations Population Fund or UNFPA, uh, the country office in Nepal. And she has coordinated joint programs with the government and multi and bilateral donor partners. I'm particularly grateful to her for honoring us with her presence today at this unearthly hour for her. It is around 2 a.m. I think from where she is speak she'll be speaking. And one of our abstract presenters, Sehlil, is also based in USA. Over to you, Chanti. Thank you very much for a kind welcome and introduction, Shoba. I'm very honored to chair today's session on humanitarian response and sexual and reproductive health and rights in Asia Pacific. Uh, as Shoba mentioned earlier, it is already the ninth session of the, this virtual rounds of the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights. I deeply appreciate all the support and dedicated efforts of the organizing team, the steering committee, and the CNS for making this uh, conference happen virtually in this challenging time. Again, warm welcome to everyone. Warm welcome, everyone. Um, as we all know, in the past decades, the effects of climate change and various types of conflict have led to an unprecedented increase in humanitarian crisis. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, Nearly 168 million people were estimated to be in need of humanitarian assistance and protection 
or about one in 45 people globally, which is the highest number in decades. Emergencies are hard on everyone, but the toll is especially heavy on the poorest and marginalized uh, and underserved members of a community. Uh, women, girls, and other marginalized groups face increased risk of an intended pregnancy, maternal death and disability, sexual and gender-based violence, unsafe abortions, and sexually transmitted infection, including HIV. In particular, Asia Pacific region has been facing various humanitarian emergency situations, either due to internal conflicts, natural disasters, and now with the pandemic. Uh, with increasing risk of climate change and global health crisis, uh, displacement will continue or possibly more foreseeable. So now it's really time that we need to accelerate our efforts for advancing family planning and sexual and reproductive health preparedness work to meet the global crisis of increasing uh, humanitarian emergencies ever, ever more people living as refugees and internally displaced. So today's virtual session, we present you a few recent studies and work focusing on the Rohingya refugees in Cox's Bajar, uh, Bangladesh, which will give us implications and some, some of insights and recommendations on uh, possible interventions that can be also applied for other preparedness work and resilience building of the region in broader context. Uh, as also Shoba mentioned, today's session will be opened by our plenary speaker, Dr. Tomoko uh, Kurukawa, and then it will be followed by abstract presentations by our four esteemed panel speakers, and then we're going to have Q&A session. Uh, so it will be a non-stop journey for the next one hour and 45 minutes, so please hold tight. Uh, now I'd like to invite Dr. Tomoko Kurokawa for a plenary speech. Dr. Kurokawa is a physician and public health specialist with over 15 years of clinical and teaching experience. She joined UNIPA in 2017 as the Deputy Director of the Pacific Sub-Regional Office in Fiji for three years, and after which she transitioned to her current role as the uh, Regional Humanitarian Advisor for UNIPA at the Asia Pacific Regional Office based in Bangkok. Um, prior to joining the UN, Dr. Kurokawa worked with numerous international NGOs, including Medicine Sans Frontiers and uh, Project Hope, leading humanitarian response in various countries and across different contexts, including disease, epidemics, natural disasters, and also post conflict settings. Uh, today, Dr. Kurokawa will share her insights on building resilience across the humanitarian development, peace building nexus. So Dr. Kurokawa, thank you for joining us today and warm welcome and please feel free to share your screen for your slides. Thank you so much, Junkie, for the warm welcome and hi colleagues from across the Asia Pacific region. Let me share my screen. Uh, can somebody just confirm if they can see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. So hi, colleagues. Again, my name is Tomoko from UNFPA. Um, I work as the Regional Humanitarian Advisor at the UNFPA Asia Pacific Regional Office based in Bangkok. And today I'll be talking about humanitarian work and the importance of working across uh, what we call the triple nexus to build resilience. So the global landscape of humanitarian action has changed considerably over the last decade. Natural disasters are increasing both in frequency and intensity at an alarming rate. Hazards are also deviating from their usual tracks, creating greater complexities that are harder to predict and difficult to forecast. And now even countries that were traditionally considered low risk are experiencing disasters. More of today's events are linked to climate change and environmental degradation. And climate change, or as we call the climate crisis, is a major driver and amplifier of disaster risk and losses. Slow onset disasters like extreme temperatures and droughts, which then lead to food and water insecurity, have quadrupled disaster-related economic losses. The number and diversity of infectious disease outbreaks are also becoming increasingly common and pose a major threat to health security and social protection. 
Among refugees and displaced persons, infectious diseases like malaria and cholera are some of the major causes of morbidity and mortality and are making humanitarian responses more complex. Infectious disease risks used to be considered low probability, high impact events, but now we really must consider them as high probability, high impact events. The number of people affected and displaced by both conflict and natural disasters has almost doubled over the past decade and is, is expected to continue rising. Armed conflicts and persecution are driving a record number of people to flee their homes in search of safety. And the number of people being displaced by drought, for example, is increasing on average by 10 million more people per year. This impact is especially severe on women and girls, people living with disabilities, and other vulnerable groups, and those consequences can be long-lasting. The cost and length of humanitarian, of humanitarian assistance requirements have also grown, in large part due to the protracted nature of crises, where interagency humanitarian appeals now last an average of seven years and the size of appeals has increased nearly 400% in the last decade. The Global Humanitarian Overview is a comprehensive evidence-based assessment of world humanitarian needs, which is launched by UN OCHA every year. The 2020 Global Humanitarian Overview indicated a total funding requirement of $28.8 billion for existing humanitarian crises. And when the COVID pandemic hit, it piled a significant addition to that. This changing humanitarian landscape is even more relevant in the Asia Pacific context, which is the most disaster prone region in the world. For natural disasters, the number of people affected in the Asia Pacific region is more than four times the number in the rest of the world. In 2018, half of all natural disasters and eight of the 10 deadliest occurred in this region. And with the climate crisis being a reality, slow onset disasters like extreme temperatures and droughts now account for nearly two thirds of disaster losses in this region. Within the model of disaster management, while there is increasing emphasis on strengthening preparedness efforts, humanitarian action largely focuses on disaster response, reacting to disasters after they've happened and responding to the needs of those affected in real time, with different phases through to recovery and mitigation still being approached in silos. With the reality of climate change and countries experiencing more overlapping natural events, countries can experience, frequently experience a double shock. And additionally, with the threat of infectious diseases and protracted conflicts, there is a potential for triple shocks further stretching the capacity of systems to respond adequately to affected populations. For example, in the Philippines, the COVID outbreak came on the heels of a series of earthquakes, typhoons, and volcanic eruption, as well as dengue and measles outbreaks. And this um, contributed to exacerbating the impacts and limiting ongoing and potentially future response efforts. Humanitarian crises undermine social development. They affect health, social protection, and livelihoods. This in turn compounds existing inequalities and socioeconomic vulnerabilities, which make it more likely that such events transmit marginalization and disempowerment across generations. This creates a vicious cycle of poverty, inequality, and disasters, which must be broken to prevent disasters from reversing hard earned development gains. This has led to a resounding call for greater coherence and a new way of working among humanitarian development, peacekeeping and peace building partners to reinforce national and local actors to build resilience. The frequent and cyclical nature of natural disasters compounded by the impacts of climate change and protracted crises requires a medium and long-term resilience and development perspective and a continuum approach across the humanitarian development peacebuilding nexus, again, commonly referred to as the triple nexus, in pursuit of collective outcomes that are sustainable, 
and meaningful and promote a strong culture of accountability. It was at the World Humanitarian Summit in 2016 where the humanitarian community came together to identify the need to transcend the humanitarian development divide. The new way of working frames the work of all actors along with national and local counterparts to reducing vulnerabilities and building resilience to contribute to the joint commitment under the SDG umbrella to leave no one behind. These humanitarian principles are supported by various global agendas and commitments to action, such as the Grand Bargain, which reflects this normative shift in enhanced efficiency and transparency in funding mechanisms and support for the localization agenda. Then there's the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, which acknowledges that disaster risk reduction requires participation that is inclusive, meaningful, and accessible for people who are disproportionately affected by disasters and advocates for gender and disability to be integrated in all policies of disaster risk management. And the Compact for Young People and Humanitarian Action, which is a global call to prioritize the needs and rights of young people affected by emergencies. So what is resilience? The key word here really is resilience and managing disaster risks. Resilience is the ability of individuals, households, communities, cities, institutions, systems, and societies to prevent, resist, absorb, adapt, respond, and recover positively, efficiently, and effectively when faced with a wide range of risks while maintaining an acceptable level of functioning and without compromising long-term prospects for sustainable development, peace and security, human rights and well-being for all. Resilience is a unifying approach that transcends the various pillars and is a prerequisite for achieving sustainable development, peace and prosperity for all, and particularly those who are furthest behind. Investing in resilience helps prevent and curtail economic, environmental, and human losses in the event of a crisis, thereby protecting development gains and bringing co-benefits across many of the sustainable development goals. So again, systems, institutions, communities, and individuals and families are considered resilient when they have at their disposal capacities and resources that are crucial to cope with and bounce back from both anticipated and unanticipated shocks. Here are just a few examples of what resilience might look like at these different levels. So at the national societal resilience um, level, resilience may look like having positive social norms and customs that support gender equality. It may entail having early warning and early action systems and having strong social protection schemes. At the institutional level, resilience may look, uh, may look like having strong health and school infrastructures, having seawalls built along vulnerable coastal areas, and having mobile health units and trained and skilled personnel that can mobilize quickly at the onset of a disaster. At the community level, it means local leadership and participation in decision-making of women and youth groups. It means having safe, equitable, and universally accessible water points. At the family and individual level, it may mean equal household decision-making, having equal livelihood and economic opportunities for all, especially women, and having supportive intergenerational relationships. It is imperative that building resilience of women and girls is seen as a shared responsibility across all actors and all sectors with gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls at the very heart and center of principled and effective humanitarian action. Even under normal circumstances and normal conditions, reproductive health issues are among the leading causes of death, illness, and disability among women of childbearing age. During and in the aftermath of disasters, women and girls are disproportionately exposed to risk, increased loss of livelihoods, security, and even lives. They lose access to essential sexual reproductive health services 
and face significantly increased risk for unintended pregnancies, gender-based violence, sexually transmitted infections, and maternal mortality. More than 50% of maternal deaths and about 45% of neonatal deaths occur in fragile contexts. Most of these deaths occur in the first 48 hours following childbirth. Globally, some 500 women and girls die each and every day from complications due to pregnancy and childbirth in countries facing humanitarian and fragile contexts. And this is often a result of sexual and reproductive health services being unavailable and not having access to delivery and emergency obstetric services. In terms of family planning, many couples want to avoid or delay pregnancy and childbearing during crisis situations, but lack the means to do so. The absence of voluntary family planning in emergencies, including condoms and emergency contraception, increases the risk of unintended pregnancies, increases health risks for pregnant women, and also possible health consequences for those who resort to unsafe abortions. Gender-based violence, already widespread in times of peace, is exacerbated during conflicts and disasters when communities' protection systems break down and gender-based violence continues to be one of the most pervasive human rights violations. Whether women or girls die, live or die in emergencies depends on whether they can access basic sexual and reproductive health services and be protected from harm. Sexual and reproductive health and family planning services and protection from violence saves lives in emergencies. They are as, as essential as food and shelter. Dr. Kroker, you have a two minutes left. We're Great. wrapping up. Thank you. There has been no greater test of our resilience than the COVID pandemic, which has had an unprecedented impact on all countries, both in terms of prompting the scaling of public health preparedness and response, and in terms of requiring mitigation of broader socioeconomic impacts. While countries with existing humanitarian crises are particularly vulnerable and less equipped and able to do so, we have seen that this pandemic has brought all health systems and national response capacities to the very limit, and that all countries were at risk of collapsing without sufficient health system support. And some countries in our region have had to deal with double and triple shocks as they weathered overlapping natural disasters. We are already seeing the far-reaching impacts of the pandemic on employment, economic downturn, protection of human rights, poverty, inequality, and social unrest, which will leave long-lasting scars on the process of recovery and rehabilitation and into development work for years to come. So this, again, requires us to apply a resilience lens and a comprehensive approach to the work that we do across the triple nexus and with all actors from all sectors. We have already seen reports of increase in maternal and neonatal morbidity and mortality, increase in unmet need for family planning, and increased risks of gender-based violence and harmful practices due to the COVID pandemic. However, as a true demonstration of resilience, we have seen some strong and amazing examples of innovation and creativity blossom amidst the pandemic and have seen partners come together to address continuity of sexual reproductive health information and service provision across the region. Here are just some examples. In Pakistan, a women's safety app was upgraded as an innovative solution for challenges of mobility and gender-based violence in, during the lockdown. In Afghanistan, a youth health line has reached over 5,000 young people from all 34 provinces, providing adolescent SRH information and services. In Mongolia, telemedicine services were set up to provide quality SRH services by practicing uh, licensed physicians. And again in Mongolia, a legendary Mongolian queen chatbot avatar provided counseling to adolescents about life and love on Facebook. And in the Philippines, through a Condom Heroes program, a free condom delivery service is now up and running to enable people in lockdown to access, to access condoms. 
So those were just a few of many examples of resilience being implemented in countries across the region. And as all countries come to terms with the new normal set by the constant threat of COVID, we will continue to see more ways in which we have collectively come together to absorb, learn from, adapt, and bounce back from this public health crisis. The constant shocks and threats that affect this region require us to demonstrate our own resilience through agility, creativity, adaptivity, and nimbleness in our work across the triple nexus, and always placing the empowerment of women, girls, and young people at the core of this work to build resilience and ensure sustainability. Thank you so much. Over. Thank you very much, Dr. Krokawa, for giving us an overview of what uh, resilience building really means to us. It is really important for us to keep in mind that humanitarian relief development programs and peace building and all those different elements are not serial processes, rather they are all needed at the same time. And the work is needed to coherently address people's vulnerability before and during and after crisis. That might mean the program should uh, remain agile and responsive to changes in context and enable capacity sharing and collaboration between humanitarian development and key sectors that helps implementers to think out of the box. So now I'd like to invite Ms. Safil uh, Ahmed uh, as our first abstract speaker. Uh, Sahilil uh, has completed her Master of Public Health from Brock University uh, in Bangladesh. Her research interests are refugee integration, population health evaluation, health systems management, community-based mixed research methods, racial, racial and ethnic uh, disparities in health and health policy. Sahilil uh, will walk us through her recent qualitative study on challenges health workers face while providing sexual and reproductive health services to Rohingya refugees in the camps in Cox's Bajar, uh, Bangladesh. Welcome, Sahil. The floor is yours for the next 15 minutes. Thank you so much for the introduction. So I'm very happy and excited today to be able to be present my study findings, which I conducted during my Master's of Public Health at Pratt James Began School of Public Health. So my study title is Challenges Health Workers Face While Providing Sexual and Reproductive Health Services to Rohingya Refugees in Refugee Camps in Cox's Bazaar, Bangladesh, a qualitative study. I will be talking on background, conceptual framework, methodology, findings, conclusions, and recommendations. Rohingya crisis is one of the largest crises globally. About 1 million people are living in camps in Kossus Bazar. With many health challenges, there is huge unmet need for sexual and reproductive health services. Providing safe, acceptable, and effective sexual and reproductive health services are always challenging for the health workers. And given the context of the humanitarian crisis, it becomes more challenging as the health workers remain unaware of the demands of the humanitarian crisis. And performance of the health workers in, the, in this crisis situations depends on a variety of factors. Uh, the factors can be related to their professional background, uh, their personal characteristics, and also some non-medical competencies. Peer research has done for understanding the health workers' perspectives on providing healthcare to refugees, and a very few studies have explored their challenges. So there is a scarcity of research and which has led to a lack of knowledge and for improvement of the training and support in crisis settings. Understanding the challenges of the healthcare will create evidence for government and NGO to develop and implement training sessions, which will aid the health workers while they are providing services in the refugee camps. This is my conceptual framework. As we can see, there are some challenges related to the health workers' capacity. Some challenges are related to the logistics and systems. Health workers' capacity related challenges can be a lack of knowledge of critical sexual and reproductive health care, inadequate skill and technical capacity, lack of training and experiences, knowledge gap on refugee health needs, language and cultural barriers. And we have to keep in mind that we are talking about the humanitarian crisis situation here. Logistics and system related challenges can be increased workload, stockouts of minimal essential elements, there can be uncertain uh, nature of the job, security concerns 
and unavailability of essential animals. All these will create challenges for the health workers, which will have impact on their psychological well-being, and the overall quality of the delivered services will be affected. This was a qualitative study. We conducted this study in 10 primary healthcare centers and five fixed health posts. One secondary hospital and Ukiah Health Complex were also included. For the data collection, we conducted 10 in-depth interviews, two focus group discussions, and five key informing interviews. The in-depth interviews were conducted with the medical doctors, midwives, and paramedics. We wanted to understand their personal experiences of facing the challenges. Community health workers were the respondents for the focus group discussions and their challenges are different. So we wanted to have in-depth understanding of their challenges as well. The persons for the key informant interviews were who involved in designing interventions, providing technical assistance, training or managing healthcare centers. So their narratives really gave us an idea about the challenges related to managing the healthcare centers, or implementing the delivery strategies. And sampling technique was, we selected the camp and health facilities by participant team, and confidence sampling was used for the respondents. This is the sociodemographic characteristics of the respondents. Three were male and 24 of them were female. In the range of age group was from 18 to 31. Their range of total working experience was two months to six years. Range of total working experience in Rohingya camps was from two months to one year and three months. The challenges were mentioned by the health workers and we categorized them into three categories. One was context specific challenges, another one delivery, service delivery related challenges, and there were some challenges related to service delivery strategy implementation. So what are the context specific challenges? Most of the health workers mentioned that there was lack of contextual orientation. They didn't really know a lot about the context there. There was language barrier. Counseling to the patients were very challenging for them because of language barrier and contextual barrier. Acceptance to community was challenging. There were security concerns. Community's understanding of illness became a challenge for a lot of health workers and condition of the roads, seasonal variation and location of the health facilities was also mentioned. So this is a prop, a paramedic, and it kind of summarizes the whole scenario for us. He said, for most of the cases, I didn't even know the problems that may arise. So from the narratives of our, the respondents, we could understand that the health workers didn't really have a lot of understanding of the context before coming to the camps. Uh, they didn't know what other challenges they're going to face. So they didn't have any mental preparation for facing those challenges. For the clinical supervisor, she said that as a doctor, you might feel that medicine is not necessary, for, but for a patient, it, it is very important. So it's tough to meet their expectations. It's about the community's understanding of illness when a patient comes to the facility, keeping in her mind that she might need medicine. And uh, as a doctor, you are assessing the patient and you are thinking that she doesn't need any medicine. So it becomes very difficult for the doctors to make the patient understand and also to uh, meet their expectations. These are the challenges that were made, uh, that were mentioned regarding to service delivery, service delivery, and these were increased workload, supply of essential drugs and equipment, which were sometimes not adequate. Diagnosing a disease was mentioned as a challenge, mostly by the doctors and midwives, because there is lack of lab facilities, and a lot of time they have to diagnose the disease based on their clinical findings only. Referral was mentioned as a challenge, mostly by the midwives. And they mentioned that whenever complicated delivery cases come, sometimes they don't know where to refer the patients. And even if they refer the patient to a heart facility, the patient party sometimes don't want to refer, take the patient to the heart facility. So the whole situation becomes challenging and complicated for the health workers. Inadequate knowledge and skill on sexual and reproductive health and unspecified job description. These were the challenges mostly mentioned by the community health workers. And now we would see why. And SRH, uh, SRH working group members said that we didn't give enough training to the community health workers. You have to make them understand about the importance of SRH. So it is very important that the community health workers understand the importance of SRH because most of the time they become the first person of contact between a patient and the health facility. So if they don't understand and if they're not well equipped, equipped and well trained, they won't be able to counsel the patient and refer the patient to the health facility properly. 
for the doctors, counseling becomes very important and it is also very challenging because given the context of humanitarian crisis, the situation is extraordinary. You have contextual barrier, you have cultural barriers, there is language barrier. And when the patient comes to the facility with sexual and reproductive health problems, they might feel shy. So it takes a lot of time for a doctor to talk to the patient and to counsel them. And moreover, they have to deal with a lot of patients every day. So counseling becomes more challenging. These are the challenges related to service delivery strategy implementation, which were mainly mentioned by our uh, key informants. They mentioned challenges regarding staff turnover, maintaining privacy in the health facilities, and prioritizing sexual and reproductive health. So a senior midwife supervisor said that prioritizing it, so sexual and reproductive health is very important and it becomes very critical for them. And when the topic is raised from a coordinator or organizational level, it will be prioritized. So it is very important that the organizations understand the importance of sexual and reproductive health. And a senior reproductive health manager said that almost all the people know the importance of primary health care, but when it comes to reproductive health, people can only think about pregnancy and delivery care. So it is again very important to make people understand that reproductive health care doesn't only mean pregnancy and delivery care, there are a lot of health problems. So the doctors need to be trained accordingly and the health workers need to understand these things also. This was very interesting in our study that we found a gender dimension of the challenges. Some challenges were more challenging for the female health workers and some were more for the male health workers. As we can see security, uh, the health workers mentioned that they feel insecure while working in the community inside the facilities during the night duty, and it was more mentioned by the female health workers. From the narratives of our health workers, we could find that they feel that it is challenging to them where facilities are in, in a remote location and during rainy season, especially it becomes difficult for the community health workers as they move within the community and they have to go to households. And again, these two challenges were perceived as less challenging by the male health workers. Acceptance to community was very interesting because the female health workers said that initially the community didn't accept them well and they would say that we can't even think that a female health worker is working in the camp. But gradually there was more acceptance, especially to the female patients. For the male health workers, they felt that there is still less acceptance to the female patients. And one midwife said that when a woman comes here, if they see any male health worker, they will say that I will prefer to die at home rather to receive services from a male health worker. So it really tells us the scenario that the male health workers face a lot of challenges, especially when they're delivering the services to female patients. This table summarizes the intensity of the challenges perceived by the health workers. And it was very interesting because we might understand and we might think that all of the challenges are perceived as most challenging for all the health workers, but this is not the scenario. As we can see, lack of contextual orientation, language barrier and counseling, these were perceived as most challenging for all the health workers. So all of the health workers mentioned that they feel challenged regarding these factors. Physical barriers were mentioned mostly by the community health workers, increased workload, community's understanding of illness, supply of essential drugs and equipment, these are mostly mentioned by the doctors as they have to deal with the patients directly. Referral was mainly mentioned as a challenge by the midwives because they have to refer the patients and sometimes they think that referral becomes a bit tricky for them. Inadequate knowledge and skill on sexual and reproductive health and unspecified dog decision, these are the two challenges that were mentioned by the community health workers mostly. So what are the impacts of these challenges faced by the health workers? We have talked about a lot of challenges. Uh, there is less consultation time due to increased workload. Convincing patients of the need of their medicine against meeting their perceived needs is a challenge. There can be lack of knowledge and technical skill on, his, on sexual and reproductive health. Following organizational rules and dealing with, with the personal values can be challenging for the health workers. And there can be unavailability of essential drugs. And all these challenges have impacts on the health workers and impact on service quality. The narratives revealed that the service quality is uh, decreased and the health workers felt that they feel stressed, depressed, there is anxiousness, there's feeling of insecurity, hopelessness and helplessness among them. And they also felt that this will affect the service quality and this will make the patients dissatisfied. 
as a result, there will be decreased service utilization by the patient. So we have to understand that the patients must have good experience in the health facilities. And for doing that, the health workers must be prepared physically and mentally. So we should understand their challenges and we should plan accordingly. This is the conclusion and recommendation. This study really reveals that there is a lack and also need for sexual and reproductive information and technical knowledge for the health workers. Uh, we really need adequate training for them, especially focusing on the challenges they're facing there. There is contextual orientation is very much needed for the health workers. The health workers need psychological and organizational support and it is for all the health workers, from community health workers to paramedics to midwives to doctors. And as the narratives of the community health workers reveals that they felt that they are not adequately trained, the job description is not that, uh, not that specified. So we have to make them understand about the importance of sexual and reproductive health. And the community health workers need to be more focused while we are arranging any training sessions. And again, need-based capacity building is required for all the health workers. I want to acknowledge all my respondents, my wonderful supportive supervisor, co-supervisor, and all my mentors, and my team members, of course, because uh, this study was really possible with the help of all of them. And we had a wonderful time uh, while working in the Rohingya refugee camps. I want, I want to mention my dear friend, Wafa, who really supported throughout this study, and Brad James Peter and School of Public Health Black University for funding this project and giving me this wonderful opportunity of working in the Rohingya refugee camps. Thank you, that would be all from me and I look forward to hearing from you in the question and session. Thank you very much, Sahli, for such an informative presentation and for keeping your time as well. <laughs> so I actually drew our attention to service providers working in the refugee uh, camps, highlighting a few recommended areas of support for them. Uh, for example, like need for promoting healthcare seeking behaviors of the displaced population, uh, skills development for community health workers, improving um, the clarity of job description and protocols, and also strengthening facility and supplies. Last but not least, quality counseling and privacy, as well as safety for female health workers were highlighted in your presentation. Thank you so much for that. And actually a few questions posted in the chat box of the Zoom uh, window. And also I'm sure we have received some of the questions through our Facebook channel. So we look forward to uh, discussing those uh, questions during our Q&A session. So now I'd like to turn to our second speaker, Mr. Sayantan uh, Choudhury. So Mr. Choudhury is currently working with UNIP Bangladesh as program analyst for maternal health at Cooks's Bazaar. He has been leading the efforts of SRH working groups implementation of maternal and perinatal mentality surveillance and response and, and also coordination for Rohingya refugee crisis in Cooks's Bazaar. He has been actively involved in improving delivery of evidence-based SRS services to the most vulnerable population in Cox's Bajar, which includes both the refugees and the host communities. He has also served in various capacity in prominent uh, public health organizations in, 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 uh, in India as well. He will present today on the genesis of maternal mortality surveillance and response in the Rohingya refugee crisis. Uh, for the next 15 minutes. Over to you, uh, Mr. Choudhury. Thank you, Dr. Wang, and uh, thank you, colleagues, for joining this session. And this piece of work has been uh, taken from the uh, UNFPA's uh, constant effort in reducing maternal mortality in the Rohingya refugee crisis. And so it was very important for us to document uh, this, uh, the genesis of the, the establishment of the maternal mortality surveillance and the response in the Rohingya refugee crisis. So it is basically a case study. So the title is the genesis of uh, maternal mortality surveillance and response in the Rohingya refugee crisis, a case study. It is authored by me and the co-author is uh, Dr. N. Dang Hansen, but I'll be the presenting author in this uh, platform. So, 
So just to give a background about uh, the context, uh, Cox's Bazar is a, uh, is a city in, uh, which is located in the southeast trade tail of Bangladesh, if you can see, it's nearing uh, the Myanmar border. And it's uh, basically it has eight uh, sub-districts, uh, which are known as Upajelas in Bangladesh. And the total population, the population of the host community in this uh, district is 2.65 million as such. And we, are, we have estimated that there are near about 1 million Rohingya refugees but uh, most of these camps, which are situated in, if you can see in the tail of this uh, district, that is um, in the Ukhia and the Tekna Upajala or the sub-district. So as this um, graph uh, shows, like uh, there were multiple influx of, uh, you know, the refugees in Bangladesh uh, before this massive influx, uh, which started in August to, uh, 2017. So, but it was a massive influx happened after the violence breakout in uh, Rakhine uh, in Myanmar. And uh, it is estimated um, somewhere around 855,000 Rohingya refugees are uh, at present in uh, Cox's Bazar, staying and in those two Upajelas or the sub-districts. Those are Ukhia and uh, Tekna in the refugee camps. So with the in, influx, uh, what we see is the demographic. So when so this is a very recent uh, data that is that uh, 1.3 million people are in need uh, for humanitarian assistance, and most of them, like 51, more than 51 percent of those uh, in need are um, women and girls. And the same applies for the refugee community too. Like 51.7 percent of this. Um, uh, who needs the assistance are women and girls. So it, it, it becomes very paramount to see the uh, health needs and the uh, health needs of these uh, women and girls. So in the effort to manage this large scale humanitarian emergency have been established, including provision of the health services. And to improve the health uh, status of these vulnerable population, the basic public health infrastructures uh, were improved or, or was supported or established by different NGOs, international NGOs, even organizations, and also even the government of Bangladesh. So as an effort to, uh, you know, to improve the health status, uh, one of the very important uh, thing is the uh, surveillance system, the disease surveillance system. So a mortality surveillance system was also established in this uh, present context. Uh, after the humanitarian emergency was declared. So therefore it was uh, interesting for us to see, uh, you know, the development and establishment of the maternal and the perinatal mortality system in the Rohingya refugee camps. As you know, that most of the deaths, uh, uh, maternal deaths are in these fragile conditions as we, as we know. So it was very interesting to see that how this whole system has been evolved and how this system has been established in the uh, present context. So the main objective of the study, the main objective of the study was to understand the establishment, the development, the implementation process of the maternal and the perinatal mortality surveillance and response system in the Rohingya refugee crisis. So this was the primary objective of the study. So the methodology used was the, the it, it is a case study which included the operational areas of MPMSR in the refugee camps and data were obtained through key informant interviews, KIIs and systematic document reviews from uh, 2017 August till November 2019. So study sites were all the 34 uh, refugee camps in Ukhia and Teknaf sub-district in Cox's Bazar district and facilities providing SRHS services to the refugees. So the data collection uh, data collection was um, uh, that we did 18 KIIs uh, with the implementers at different levels in the community, in the facility, and also with the members of the MPMSR committee, researchers, uh, those who are involved with uh, refugee health and have been working in Cox's Bazaar and also some document reviews like documents such as meeting minutes, uh, reports, and the bulletins. 
an inductive uh, qualitative content analysis was used for um, analyzing this data. So coming to the findings as such, uh, the findings were basically um, uh, classified into you know two major themes came up that was establishment and development of the uh, surveillance system as a whole and also the implementation process of the system that is the maternal and perinatal mortality surveillance system so under this two themes the findings were sub uh, means uh, were uh, sub discussed and again as we see the establishment and development, as we can see, the, as in August 2017, the new influx of the Rohingya populations from Rakhine to Cox's Bazaar, but the general mortality surveillance started somewhere around November or December in 2017. So it took six months to uh, set up a system where general mortality surveillance uh, would start and we get account of those deaths. So. In the aftermath of this uh, development of this general mortality tool as such, so the implementation took another four or five months. So it, uh, it was in Feb to February 2018 that uh, the general mortality uh, surveillance was implemented in some of the camps. Now coming to this slide with this, this explains about the chronology of the events which has led to the establishment and development of uh, the maternal and perinatal mortality surveillance system as a whole. So these are some of the key events which has uh, facilitated the, you know, the establishment of the um, committee and the also the uh, system as a whole. And so it started way back in like in uh, 2018 March, UNFPA with uh, technical support from ICGDRB conducted a population and demographic survey. Um, with uh, basically with the uh, to see the health needs of this uh, vulnerable population, specifically the women of reproductive age uh, group. So this was in 2018 March, and then subsequently we see that uh, you know UNFPA with CDC technical support from CDC did a situation and analysis regarding the maternal and perinatal mortality surveillance. So then in May 2018, so the maternal mortality audit forms, uh, which are developed by UNHCR was piloted for uh, some of the uh, facilities in the camps. So this, this form was piloted in May 2018 for facility death reviews. And uh, we see in September 2018, UNFPA with support of CDC conducted a uh, reproductive age mortality study, which was a retrospective in nature, like they, uh, they analyzed the retrospective data of last one year, like from 2017 to 2018. And um, they tried to see, you know, uh, the, uh, what were the major cause of the deaths and uh, what are the age groups which are being affected by uh, this uh, deaths. So mortality, so distribution of the mortalities they saw. And these results were disseminated in March 2019. And some of the key uh, findings from uh, this uh, dissemination of Ramos study was like the, you know, the, the number, the percentage of uh, death in, you know, the maternal, uh, the women of reproductive age group, and also in the neonatal age group and also the place of death, like the, uh, where these deaths have happened. So that led to also the formation. So because, because most of those deaths, like somewhere around 50 to 59% of those deaths were uh, at home, means that, that means at community level. So that, that uh, propagated the thought of uh, having a, uh, you know, the community-based surveillance system as a whole. And to response to, in response to this, the WHO EWARS was introduced to notify the general mortality in the uh, community. So the next thing which was very important uh, in terms of the uh, mortality surveillance as, as the maternal mortality surveillance was the uh, formation of the steering committee, which is known here as uh, the maternal and perinatal mortality surveillance and response committee which is also under the SRH working group was formed. And this was formed in July, 2019. And as subsequently we see uh, the 
prospect in PMSR. That means, uh, so till now it was the, the, the prospective data and they analyzed and they, um, uh, one of the recommendation was that uh, for a prospective surveillance, so prospective maternal mortality surveillance, and uh, this, this uh, effort was introduced uh, in September 2019. So this is the chronology of the event as such uh, in terms of how the system evolved from, you know, uh, from basic situational analysis to a very robust uh, prospective surveillance system as such. These are some of the findings from the Ramos study, which uh, the retrospective, which uh, led to the thoughts of, you know, having a prospective surveillance um, system as such. So as you see, neonatal deaths were somewhere around 13.8% and the omen of reproductive age death were also 136 So cumulatively, this group was uh, uh, amounting to a death of somewhere around 26 or 28%. So it was uh, very much important to see, you know, uh, what were the real causes of those deaths. And in that response, the whole system got generated. This is so the next thing was uh, the place of death. As you can see here, like uh, some of the deaths, were, I mean, maximum of the deaths were, you know, in at the home, so at the community level, that 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 uh, created, you know, the um, need for uh, coming up with a community-based surveillance, which was introduced by the WHO EWARS. So this has been also you know, been a key thing in terms of the prospective surveillance also because the prospect the community surveillance the general mortality surveillance in the community serve as the base for the prospective maternal mortality surveillance so so there were some updates also about the prospective maternal uh, mortality surveillance so the maternal and neonatal mortality surveillance uh, was designed in april 2019 and viewers uh, mortality component designed and trained uh, trainings were conducted and in june and august this whole this whole how to monitor the system was also de uh, developed so a monitoring system has been developed and the tools have been developed and piloted so this was in the month of june and uh, august and following to this uh, happened was the training for the verbal autopsies which are conducted in the community and the facility death reviews so this happened so um, this this is something some work about the uh, so this is the timeline which shows some work about the prospective mortality surveillance time you have two minutes to wrap up please thank you so the next thing, the next theme which came uh, prominently was the implementation of the MPMSR in the Rohingya response. So this was subdivided into two uh, sub themes. That was the coordination mechanism as a whole, uh, how the health sector of the health uh, coordination goes here, and also the maternal mortality, maternal and perinatal mortality surveillance system, how the, how the coordination goes in. So how it is the system is the uh, is implemented in in the field. So, as you can see, like the health sector coordination in Rohingya response, a total 100 uh, NGOs, INGOs, and partners are there with the uh, system right now. So, it is under the leadership of the uh, civil surgeon and the district um, health coordination uh, officer from the DGHS and also from the WHO. So, we also, so here they have also a strategic advisory group, which is an advisory role to the health sector coordinator. And then we see the, you know, the, the cluster, uh, cluster uh, health cluster our sector as such, uh, it has some uh, working groups, the SRH working groups and the MSPSS working group, CHW working group and the case management, AP case management working group. Under the SRH working group, we see a MPMSR committee and under MPMSR committee, we see a MPMSR subcommittee, which acts more of a secretariat for operational, uh, you know, works. So as a whole, the system looks like this, uh, like um, they have a facility component and a community component. So these are some of the, uh, like this is the main system, the system that, you know, the deaths from the community are captured through the CHW system. The deaths from the facilities are uh, captured through the uh, health providers and the SRH partners. And these data goes to the, uh, the MPMSR committee 
and then uh, from the MPMSR committee, the recommendations and the reports are compiled to the system and sent to the, you know, uh, to the SRH working group and also to the uh, government health officials and the action on the feedback and the response uh, is also initiated. So this is the uh, this is the flow of the data. How does the data flow as such in the community from the community till till the uh, uh, review is done? So it is through the CHW working system as and also the health facilities. The data goes to the MPMSR committee and where you know each deaths get reviewed. Uh, verbal autopsy happens in the uh, community and uh, facility death review happens in the. Uh, in a facility and these reports are compiled and the action points are sent to the government officials and also the SRH working group and the health sector. So this gives the mechanism how a CHW um, you know, collector data and how this data is uh, reported in the EORs, in the WHO EORs and again how the committee gets this data uh, and they perform the verbal autopsies in the field. So this is also. I think you have only one minute left. <laughs> so this is the this is the um, data flow again. How how the data are uh, flown from one point to another. So at present, uh, the surveillance system as such is active in all the camp except one camp, which is uh, means this is still uh, when when. Uh, is camp, I think it's 23, one of the camps which is a bit isolated from the other camps. Uh, I think that is not part of the um, system as such, but other camps are covered. So there are some conclusions. So the surveillance is well accepted by the health system at all levels. The maternal mortality surveillance coordinator's position denotes a deep commitment to address maternal and perinatal health and a sense of accountability in the SRH working group. And the committee is at the center of the MPMSR system as such from data collection to analyzing and also facilitating the uh, you know, recommendations and sending these uh, actionable uh, points. The uh, other conclusions are the facility and the community-based components uh, of the maternal mortality surveillance is equally enforced. So, and the review of the maternal deaths are systematically done and classified according to the three delay models and verbal autopsies are systematically undertaken in a case of identification of community maternal death. So some of the recommendations, this is the last slide, I guess. So it's the systematic follow-up of, so some of the interview, interviews uh, had recommendations like systematic follow-up or monitoring of the formulated actions and improve in planning for the capacity building of the people, and the, of the service providers, CHWs involved in this surveillance system. And also discussion on integration of the MPMSR system, which is a very ref uh, refugee specific system with the national MPDSR system, which is a very strong robust system again. So, so linking those two. So these were some of the recommendations from the, uh, which has come up in the study. So on that note, I'm sorry, I've taken a little bit more time and thank you so much. So in Bengali, they say here on a so it's many thanks. Thank you. Oh, Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Then um, it was very encouraging to learn about this collaborative uh, efforts building capacity for basic public health infrastructure uh, through more, uh, uh, mortality surveillance and response system. Uh, so now I'd like to invite our third speaker, Ms. Sigma uh, Sigma Aino. So Sigma is a program manager and senior program officer at. Uh, Population Council Bangladesh office with expertise in the fields of adolescent sexual and reproductive health and women empowerment. She has more than uh, 10 years experience of working with adolescent and young population in various settings, including rural, urban, slums, Rohingya refugee camps in Bangladesh. So she provides technical assistance to the Directorate General of Family Planning of Bangladesh in development of adolescent sexual and reproductive health related policy documents, manuals, and guidelines, and also serves as technical committee uh, member of National Strategy for Adolescent Health for Bangladesh, National Plan of Actions for Adolescent Health Strategy for 2017 to 2030 as well. So I think uh, we're, I'm very happy to 
to have you here so that we can hear some of the in, uh, insights and perspective for the elders and to use in this um, you know, humanitarian crisis as well. So she will uh, present us on uh, contraceptive non-use among the Rohingya and changing dynamics in post-displacement in uh, to Bangladesh. Welcome, Sigma, over to you. Thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you, Shobha, CNS, um, and the audience. Warm welcome to the audience and the colleagues who have joined with us uh, in this virtual session from around the world. Let me share my presentation here. Uh, Chungi, can you confirm uh, whether it's perfect? The yes, we can see the present view. Can see Thank okay. you. So I will today present our study findings uh, on the quality of assessment that look, looked into sexual reproductive health practices among the Rohingya in the camps. Uh, but specifically, it's a larger study. Specifically, today my talking will be focused on the contraceptive non-use among the Rohingya and the reasons or the uh, uh, reasons behind that. That what drives them on this, uh, their perception and their social norms that drives this uh, contraceptive non-use. And we also, this study will focus into the, in the changing dynamics after the post-displacement to Bangladesh, whether anything has changed, if any, and what are the inroads that can be taken to increase their SRHR service uptake and uh, decrease the resistance to our contraceptives. So as my previous speaker has gone through some background of this Rohingya and their uh, latest influx, I'll not go in detail of that, but what I would like to emphasize here is that the study we have done in the recent uh, influx of the Rohingya that and we did in the Ukhya uh, Upajela in the camp, and this new influx of population is fairly young, 60% uh, 60, uh, 60 we have found that is below age 18. And what, uh, what is historically Rohingya has been understudied due to in part to their uh, exclusion in Myanmar. They have not been uh, counted in censuses. So when, uh, so we have very little knowledge about their demographic profile, their education, marital uh, practices, their sexual reproductive health service practices, their contraceptive choice and so on. So when this uh, government of Bangladesh uh, services and Sigma, you're frozen and breaking somehow. Maybe you can turn up your video, just only um, show, share your screen. Okay, okay. My internet connection is showing a little unstable. That happens. <laughs> yeah. And also it's raining in Dhaka today, so maybe that also causes some trouble. Okay, uh, so UNFP was leading this uh, response service for sexual and reproductive uh, health crisis for adolescent girls and women. And at, as part of this need assessment, uh, first uh, UNFP did this one study that with ICD Derby that Shantan already mentioned earlier. And from that, uh, that was done to understand the demographic profile, that was a quantitative survey, and to design the response of this maternal and child health services. So from that, we knew some uh, data already by that we going into this scam that their childbearing and child pregnancies are fairly early like uh, our, ours in Bangladesh, but their contraceptive prevalence rate is low. If we compare ourselves, it's CPR was 34%. We knew that the facility delivery is very low. We knew that sexual reproductive service uptake was very low. But what we need to understand and then the follow-up study, the, our study that Population Council did is this qualitative study that is a follow-on of that UNFPA ICT DRB study. And this study is also funded by UNFPA. And here we wanted to look at what, what are the reasons that they are not taking up these services, despite this uh, supply of the health post, despite these providers and commodities, why are they are not taking up the services as we expected? So this quality uh, lens was focused on the reasons and factors behind their um, practices and what we can do to design the programs better. So this study was a quality study and we did this uh, data collection in the late 2018 
um, almost a one year after the uh, this displacement happened. Um, and we collected the data in two time frames. Uh, whether what is the practice uh, in the Myanmar, what are the social norms, and what are they practicing now? So pre and post arrival to Bangladesh in these two time frames, the data was collected. The main uh, target group was the young adolescent and youth population, aged 14 to 24. But we also did some community uh, gatekeepers interviews because they are very influential for this community. And to understand the community norm, we have to address those issues. So we did uh, the right hand side of this uh, map shows the uh, camps that where we did our study. At the time when we did this um, data collection in 2018, the larger camp in Ukiah was further subdivided into 20 smaller camps and we did uh, data collect in five of these camps. And uh, these larger camps were further divided into blocks and their administrative leaders called Majis who manage these blocks and who are responsible mostly for administrative purpose to, who distribute the rations and other facilities and services. So they were uh, one of the major gatekeeper. So there was also religious leaders. So we did a uh, focus group discussion with Majis and Imam to understand the social perception and community norms. We did in the interview with the uh, Rohingya male, female, married, unmarried uh, population. We did in the interviews with program managers and service providers who directly work with this population. So moving on to the findings, um, we looked into the, what are the um, norms and practices they hold uh, regarding contraceptive non-use. But we have found that um, the teaching of Islam, the belief that Islam prohibits the use of contraceptive methods was commonly reported by all groups of Rohingya. And respondent mentioned that having more children is encouraged uh, by Islam and always reiterated by their religious leaders. And there was a her, many large, many preference for large families. So I'll try, uh, like to read a quote here from a married woman age 21. The Hujurs, Muslim religious leaders, tell us not to use contraceptive method. It is a sin. Allah made women fertile so that they can bear children. And there was a strong uh, voice of that. They want to increase the Muslim claim as there was a lot of killing in Myanmar. Uh, it came from various respondents that they do not want to limit children because they want to increase the Muslim claim. Misinformation goes hand in hand with this religious teaching and we have found there is a strong fear and mistrust about this uh, use of contraception. The most common uh, thing is that they think that it will, it will destroy the reproductive health system and they'll never be able to bear children again. Um, and there is also we have found there's a strong association uh, they try to make up with this uh, immortality or the promiscuous behavior with contraception. I would like to uh, read out a quote here from a, from a focus group discussion with Majis. Bad people use condom for going to bad place. Why would anyone use condom among family between husband and wife? And what we found this, uh, this religious teaching and these misconceptions were again reiterated by these uh, community gatekeepers and the family members who are the major gatekeepers. We have found that uh, <coughs> very strong influence was in uh, about, of this husband and mother-in-laws. They play a crucial role in decision-making of uh, women's fertility. So a married uh, girl, age 20, she was saying, I wanted to have pill, but my mother-in-law restricted me. She says, I'll die. My husband also did not let me. I tried several times in secret, but could not. Women want relief in their body, but husbands and their family want children they say it's Allah's order. So these are the common things we have found that they hold the norms and perceptions. And then we also try to explore uh, in the changing dynamics uh, when they have displaced to Bangladesh, what are they are practicing now uh, in this increased availability and this uh, change situation. So what have come out from uh, that from across the, all the respondents, they identify and acknowledge that there is a benefit of contraceptive in case of uh, protecting the health of a mother and baby, and also in, in a situation in, to face the challenges of dis displacement. And it seems that being in a transient set has decreased the resistance towards contraception. Uh, a married girl uh, quote I will uh, read out here, in our society, 
people think more children as good thing. This is Allah's will. But the case is different in camp. Here living space is small. There's shortage of food and no money. Living condition is constrained and hard here. Women here should use contraceptives. The similar notions we have found in the FGDs with this Majis and uh, the, with the interviews with the male uh, respondents that we are in miserable time. We are in neither Bangladesh nor Myanmar. We are of nowhere. If they drove us now, where will you go uh, with so many children? For this, women are now using contraceptives. The other thing that came out that with the combination of this increased availability of contraceptive compared to Myanmar, and also with the influence of group behavior, that the women here are now seeing that other one is using it, and there's a lot of, uh, lot of supply of it. So they are together these things too has increased uh, increased the contraceptive use here in the camp. A married girl of age 20 was saying more people are having pills here in the camp. Use of depot is also more than before Myanmar because it is easily available here. Birth spacing is good for both mother and children. I think everyone should use it because now nothing is like before. The other thing is very interesting that to understand this uh, community, you have to understand the sentiment. Something are acceptable to them, something are not. And sometimes the right messaging is key. What we have found that birth spacing is acceptable over birth control. Although this thing that the birth control is seen, but even in the religious uh, leaders FGDs, they have found that we have found that they, there's a scope for using the birth spacing message because they think it's allowable in Islam for the sake of the health of mother and children, birth spacing is allowable. So these are the things you have to understand if you want to have uh, greater access to this community. And also we have found that certain contraceptives are more acceptable than others. And there are reasons for that. Certain contraceptives, they have some fear about that. So I'd like to read a quote here from a uh, focus group discussion with the adult woman. We have heard of implant. It is taken for four to five years, but we are afraid to receive this implant. If we insert and then we go, need to go back to Myanmar, how can we remove it there? Who will help us? This fear works in mind. So if anyone dies with it inside body, that will be of great sin. So these are the things that uh, mentioned that to understand their culture is very important, which Sahil has also em emphasized in her presentation that the service provider reported that it's very, un very difficult to understand their context and their cultural beliefs. And without understanding those, if we just put the supplies, may, that may not give us the best results. So several things that has been emphasized by the uh, provider, service providers and the program managers is that there is a lot of misconception. There is a lack of knowledge about SRHR. So they emphasize on uh, giving more community health education that needs to be prioritized. And it's important to engage different groups of actors, uh, especially those Majis who are, and also they're young. So to reach to this husband, uh, the strong gatekeeper in the family, we need to work with these Majis and you have to choose them, uh, choose among the progressive one among them so that can, we can work with this husband. And also the Rohingya community is a very male dominant community. So to diffuse the uh, sole control of male, we also need to engage the females and most probably the elderly females will be younger women and to, uh, to spread this message of the importance of SRHR and uh, contraceptives. The other thing we have to be, um, uh, keep in mind that they for for the long time they are not used to go to these health facilities. See so in Myanmar they are not habituated to go to these facilities because there is not availability. So even if we uh, put these health facilities, it's not easy for them to reach out this facility. There is a psychological barrier. They never felt the need to go there. So we have to be strengthen the outreach services more and engaging Rohingya volunteers along with this Bengali service provider may aid in to build the trust and to gain our access better with this community. And also considering about the low literacy level, um, the audio more visual, so more visual uh, responsive education tool should be used. So these are for now, I'll stop here. Thank you all for patient hearing. 
Thank you very much, Sigma, for your presentation and also keeping your time uh, very well as well. Uh, so it was really powerful to hear the real voice from the ground and also you uh, touch some of uh, misperception and stigma regarding the contraceptive use among the Rohingya population as well as for oppositions from gatekeepers, uh, which were there even before displacement. So uh, it was really um, good to learn about some of recommended, recommended actions uh, for as well. I mean, for that, we can maintain the positive dynamic change. Uh, now we have our last speaker awaiting, so we've come a long, a long way. <laughs> so let me invite Ms. Manju uh, Kamacharya. Manju has worked uh, for more than 19 years in public health research in organizations like UNICEF, WHO, and UNEPA in Nepal, Bangladesh, and Poland. Um, she contributed significantly in the late um, uh, 90s for the establishment of midwifery-led birth Breeding centers in remote and hard to reach communities in Nepal. She has also helped uh, the establishment and certification of adolescent friendly SRHR services in the Nepal health system since 2015 and institutionalized the comprehensive sexuality education in school curriculum in 2017. She has also provided strategic technical leadership for more than 50 partners as uh, SRHR subsector coordinator to deliver comprehensive uh, SRH services, which proven vital in response to protracted emergencies, including COVID-19. So Manju will present on uh, transitioning from min minimum initial service package for, um, let me just rephrase that, minimal, minimal initial <laughs> service package missive, as we all know, to comprehensive SRH services responding to the Rohingya crisis. So welcome, Manjuzi. Uh, sorry for keeping you waiting long. So the floor is yours for the next 50 minutes. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, Chongyi. Uh, let me share my uh, screen. Well, it's my great pleasure to share uh, my experiences uh, in this platform. Thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, Manju Karmachari from Nepal. And uh, my topic uh, presentation is transitioning from minimum initial service package to comprehensive SRHR services, responding to a protracted emergency to the uh, Rohingya crisis in Cox's Bazar, Bangladesh. Uh, before presenting over this one, I'd like to let you know that I'm currently now a PhD student in the University of Huddersfield in UK. Since I'm no more uh, with the employment of the UNFPA, uh, I will be presenting data based on the availability of the publishing data, uh, some of the published document. And uh, it's because of the, uh, you know, the organization's data policy ethics, so that I need to mention here and apology for that. But uh, however, uh, the experiences what I gained with the two years of experiences working with the uh, Rohingya crisis response, I'll be sharing more about how we've been able to make sure the provision of the comprehensive SRHR services in relation to the protracted emergency. So this is the scenario that you could see that uh, our uh, previous presenter has men uh, mentioned that these are located in the, especially in the Okia and Technop sub-districts of the Cox Bazar district. And my presentation will cover uh, mostly on the humanitarian coordination where the SRHR working group coordination is led by UNEP and I'll be presenting more about the major intervention that we have taken place in 2018 and 2019 with the way forward. Okay, so um, the Texas Bajar Rohingya camp is the largest refugee camp in the world after the influx started on the 25th of August 2017 and it's already three years completed. And total 1.2 million population with a, around 855,000 Rohingya population located over there with the 52% women who is highly vulnerable with the risk of the gender violence. And 
there is a, a 344,000 women of reproductive age who really need a life-saving SHR services. And apart from the Rohingya crisis, um, these populations are also facing the complex emergencies with the cyclone and COVID-19 pandemic. Thus, the UNEP, in coordination with the Minister of Health and Office for the Refugee Relief and Repatriation uh, Commissioner, Commissioner and the other relevant SRHR stakeholder, implemented MISB for SRHR immediately after the onset of the crisis. And now in the protracted emergency, we are ensuring provision of the SRHR benefits. So you can see here the uh, intersector coordination group, the CG, which coordinates different sectors, including the health sector and protection sector and other sectors that you could see over here. Health sector is led by WHO and under the umbrella of the health sector, there is a various subsector working groups uh, working over there. And one of the working group is SRHR working group led by the UNAPA. This is the sample of the SR working group coordinates meeting lead by UNIP every fortnightly. The time when the onset of the emergency, there is a uh, every week there is a meeting uh, along with the need basis. But from 2018 December, we started fortnightly meeting, and because of the pandemic, now the um, uh, virtual meeting is going on. So the objectives of the SRS working group is to ensure the SRS issues of the target population are addressed as a priority with, uh, with the maintaining the standard of the national and international guidelines, mapping, mapping of the SRHR for the equal distribution of the services, and um, providing the guidance to the service points uh, through the research and study, and also the coordination with the Minister of Health, um, uh, Civil Surgeon, DGFP, DDF, uh, DDFP, along with the partners and the sectors, and uh, working with a coordinated manner to avoid the duplication of the resources and information management support uh, mechanism established in the SRHR working group to motivate to all the SRHR partners to be um, reporting to the uh, working group to ensure that the knowledge management is there. And one major uh, role of the SRS working group is uh, to advocate the policy and decision makers and donors for the resource mobilization. So if you see this uh, slide over here, um, based on the UNIP estimates from the ICDRB study, um, of the total 304,000 women of the report age, uh, it is expected that pregnant women are 28,800. And in the beginning of the uh, crisis, the minimum initial service package for the SRS services are ensured through the mobile report health camps and later on deploy the midwives in the existing health facilities as well as the uh, health facilities established in the camp settings with ensuring the clinical management rate and distribution of uh, RS kits for the uh, SRHR services. Apart from the health sector part, uh, there is a support made with the women-friendly spaces where the women comes for the services with the psychosocial support and protection and awareness messages as well as the dignity distribution for respecting the dignity of the women and the girls. Uh, this is a sample that I'm sharing about the unip support health facilities where uh, implementing through various partners. And there are total 22 health facilities supporting of up to 22 health facilities, 20 are 24 seven health facilities uh, led by the midwives. And uh, 20, 19 women friendly spaces are in, uh, located in Lokia, uh, Ukiah and Tekna uh, sub-districts where a midwife is also deployed and uh, through these women friendly spaces also the SRHR services is uh, delivering, for instance, uh, uh, basically the family planning services, all types of family planning services along with the CMR, in the in the very uh, um, uh, privacy and confidential manner through this uh, um, sector, so there is a, a integration of the SRHR and GBB that you could see in the both in the health facilities and also in the uh, women friendly spaces. So in the beginning of the uh, crisis, the MISP is ensure with these all the six major objectives of the minimum initial service package for section of health. And uh, you can see that the uh, uh, objective number five is uh, about the prevent unintended pregnancies, which is added mostly in the revised uh, MISP guideline of 2018. And as part of the one, number one objectives, uh, SRH working group is leading by the UNEP for all SRHR partners. And now it's already in the post emergency from, uh, from 2018 onwards. And uh, in the post-emergency situation, uh, it is to make sure that the comprehensive SRS services is integrated into the existing primary health care centers and provide these services with the, uh, with the support of the strengthening the six pillars of the health system strengthening. 
So these are the, some of the claims of the provision of the comprehensive SRS services that is now implementing in the uh, um, health facilities, especially in the 24-7 health facilities, with the making sure of the basic and the comprehensive emergency obstetric and newborn care services in the referral sites as well. Most importantly, the, uh, the NCPNC delivery family planning services, menstrual regulation, post-abortion care, clinical man management of, of the rape, it's all the life-saving services as well as other services like the STI infiltration, adolescent action, reproductive health and rights, and also some of the uh, morbidities, uh, maternal morbidities like the obstetric fistula screening and stomach cancer screening is ongoing. Uh, to increase these uh, uh, you know, services, uh, utilizing of the services, a uh, most important part of the community-based SRS service is really important. And uh, we are coordinating with the community health working groups to make sure that uh, CSWs, community health workers and the volunteers are uh, reaching out to home to home visit and communicating and educating the services that is available in the health facilities. So these are the glimpses of some of the major interventions that was made and the progress that we have. Uh, mostly the SRS working group uh, 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 more, uh, encouraged to all the SRS partners uh, who are more than 50 partners are participating in the working group meeting and uh, uh, encouraging for the evidence-based midwife-led care and to save the lives of mother and newborn. Evidence-based interventions driven by the quality data management um, almost 34 partners are reporting the, um, uh, the SRHR services and uh, these are managed uh, by the SRH working group and also feedback to the uh, partners for further planning and uh, implementation with the um, technical guidelines that is being provided by the SRH working group along with the uh, working with the coordination and partnership and also the advocacy for the resource mobilization basically. So here is some of the uh, examples that I would like to highlight here. Basically, the utilization by other kids, commodities, supplies in 2018 and 2019 are utilized by the SRH partners. And they, they make the request to SRH working group and the SRH working group provides other kids to all the SRH partners. So through this slide, you can see that there is a huge increment of the utilization of the different kits uh, compared to 2018 to 2019. And in, in the beginning of the crisis, uh, total 13,721 Delta kits also distributed in 2017, 2018. And here I'm trying to bring the, some of the major achievements uh, uh, based on the uh, data availability. Uh, first, the best delivery that you could see that 21.5% in 2018, and, and uh, that is based on the study, whereas in 2019, uh, there is an annual report, joint response plan report shows that uh, there is an increase of the facility based delivery, which is 47%. And this annual joint report is, uh, response plan um, that you could see that from this is the reference of the um, community health working group who is doing now the home to home visit to collect the data who has given birth at home and who has given birth at the health facility. So as of the September 2019, 47%, but in the March 2020 that we got at already 52%. So um, the annual uh, joint response plan 2020 has now targeted to 60% delivery, whereas in 2019 it was targeted to achieve 55%. Similarly, the contraceptive prevalence rate that you can see that almost 34% uh, that is uh, accessed by in, in 2018 uh, data. And in 2019, there is, uh, the study is already done, but the result is not yet published. However, there, there is a high, I mean, increased uh, trend of the utilization of the contraceptive prevalence rate there. So comprehensive emergency obstetric and newborn care, which is a life-saving services at the campsite, it is available only two in 2018 and it increased to four in 2019. Similarly, adolescent family services is established. Uh, there is a young mother support group in Ukiah and Tekna, and two started in October 2018. In 2019, it's already increased to five. And uh, in relation to referral hub at the community to avoid a second delay uh, based on the, uh, um, based on the um, of evidences and the feedback and also from the maternal mortality review that is being done in the facility base, uh, we came to know that um, the community-based referral hub was not there at 2018, but with the basis of the evidence and the lesson learned, we established in 13 camps in 2019. And uh, along with that, the obstetric fistula screening was done in 2018 only in the outreach camp basis, whereas now in 2019, um, through the out, um, outreach camp, health facilities, and also through the community health workers are doing the screening. 
at the home level. Uh, Sir Bhagat Cancer Screening also uh, started only in March 2019 as part of the uh, provision of the comprehensive essential services. And most importantly, uh, the community-based uh, SRHR training package, the comprehensive SR training package developed for the CSWs and volunteers in 2019. And uh, of the tw uh, total 1,600 um, CSWs working throughout the 34 camps, 1,000 CSWs and volunteers were trained on comprehensive SR training package and also distributed the flip chart uh, educational materials that they are using it for the home to home visit and educating women and family family in the communities. And they are liaising between the health facilities and also at the uh, community. So they are the one actually playing a key role to increasing access to and the utilization of the SR services. This is one of the examples. Yeah, this is an example of family planning services uh, that you could see over here. That uh, the mostly used, common use uh, family planning services is pills and injectables. And in 2019, we also introduced BMPA subcutaneous along with the intramuscular, and there is a use of 80 percent. Uh, here you can see the picture that the old ladies are actually they are the uh, traditional birth attendants from the Myanmar and they are now working as a volunteer to reach out to the women at, at home and mobilizing basically for increasing access to institutional delivery. A, a sample of the you know, uh, flip card that we have distributed to each um, uh, CSWs and volunteers and they are using it for educating mothers and family members. A sample of the community referral hub with 24-7 uh, ambulance and the ambulance at the health facility also starts in some of the places we have ambulance. These are some of the glimpses of the training that we have provided, training of TOTs uh, on clinical management rape, adolescent sexual rape health, MISP, and so on. Uh, these are some uh, glimpses of the joint monitoring made by high-level uh, uh, government officials from Dhaka and also the Cox's Bajar for the cervical cancer screening. And some interagency monitoring is ongoing with the presence of the RRC, UNFA, UNCR, and NGOs. And most importantly, uh, with the no one left behind policy, SRS services for marginalized specific group is also started in the UKIA level. And apart from that, uh, uh, we have also made of the pandemic response so with, the, with the services available in the health facilities, making sure that all the um, guidelines are utilized while providing the services uh, with this COVID-19 pandemic response. And uh, almost total 1 in 9 to 45 women and girls raised with the dignity kids, uh, respecting their dignity uh, during the uh, crisis. So there are some challenges apart, uh, while we are implementing through the SR working group, but there are some way forward also I have highlighted here. Mentorship is a major challenge because of the COVID now. But um, a turnover the skilled healthcare work providers is also another challenge where we really need to focus on additional healthcare pro providers needs to be make sure with the capacity building. And uh, um, there are limited referral hub at the community in 30 camps and uh, there is a need of some of the remote areas also and that needs to be expansion is required. And available to blood donors and uh, uh, to, to address the low utilization of the essential SRS service during this COVID pandemic, we really need to mobilize continuously to the CSWs and volunteers. And also we really need to encourage for the volunteer interagency monitoring following the nine rules of the humanitarian aid workers uh, in this COVID pandemic. And one important thing I would like to highlight here is uh, to increase the access to the long um, acting reversible contraceptives, especially the implantant. Uh, we really need to advocate on implant services by midwives and paramedics to, to make, make sure that that is being uh, provisioned by midwives and paramedics as well. Currently, it is only distributing, I mean, you know, the, uh, uh, providing the services by the doctors all in the Bangladesh. And uh, because of the COVID pandemic also, the funding is a challenge, so this is a continuous process of the uh, work of the health working group. In conclusion, in the acute setting, we really need to focus on the MISP for SRHR services to, to focusing on um, focusing on the life-saving services. And in the protracted setting, the provision of the comprehensive SRHR services is really need to ensure with the scale human resources for aborting maternal and newborn mortality and morbidity, as well as the overall uh, preventing mort uh, mortality among the WRA. So um, uh, the lesson learned is uh, we really need to uh, uh, look at that, how coordination is uh, important and coordination saves lives during 
any kind of acute or protracted settings that we need to work in a collaborative and partnership way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Manjuji, and thank you all the plenary and abstract, abstract speakers. I think we've covered such a wide range and very critical dimensions that we need to keep on working and putting efforts together to be more prepared in humanitarian crisis and complex settings in the Asia Pacific. Humanitarian response is indeed not a single um, like standalone interventions, either only for a short Im immediate term emergency response, nor only apply to the displaced population, but the community as whole, and also throughout uh, the entire spectrum of development and resilience building, as we all kind of like uh, discussed. It is very timely that uh, preparedness toolkit for sexual reproductive health care in emergencies will be launched in the coming weeks. Women Planning 2020, IPPF, Joan Snow Women's Refugee Commission, and UNIP have been collaborating with interagency working group on reproductive health in crisis to develop this preparedness toolkit. So this upcoming toolkit will provide us guidance and resources to ensure that quality essential SRH services are available at the onset of an emergency response. So it's pretty inevitable that challenges ahead of us, but we will be working together and we will be more prepared and our partnership will be stronger than ever. So now I'd like to give the floor back to Shoba for Q&A session. So again, thank you so much everyone for your participation and also contribution to the, today's session. Over to you, Shoba. Uh, thank you, Chonyi. And uh, we have now the open session. We already have too many questions which have come in. And uh, maybe we will have to extend the session for a little longer, but interesting question. And so without much ado, the first question is from Magdalena Abelera. And the question is for Chonhi. Uh, what strategies could be adopted to prevent unplanned or unintended pregnancies during the COVID-19 pandemic, considering the restricted mobility and limitations of uh, uh, human uh, resources? Thank you very uh, much for that really good question. So uh, I know a few countries in Asia still restrict the move mobility of uh, women and girls uh, to seek their healthcare and also um, SRH services. So I think as um, Dr. Kurokawa mentioned earlier, so I think we need to really um, think about what kind of an innovative approach that we can try. So uh, because of the limited mobility, so somehow we can look at uh, using the digital platform uh, and also the e-health and mobile health. So I kind of, kind of like different platform that we can use for like sharing information and services. And also we can look at um, like a working with community health workers and outreach uh, community, um, the volunteers in a better way and also more with more protection uh, for them as well. So I think uh, there are a lot of uh, different ways that we were thinking and also some of the governments and, and partners, they are trying many different uh, kind of approaches. So, um, you know, I, I'm working as a, um, in the Epi 2020 team, so I'm happy to share some of uh, best practices that is possible. Thank you. Uh, there is another question from Magdalena for Tomoko, our plenary speaker. And the question is, what strategies could be adopted to prevent online child abuse and other forms of gender violence during COVID-19, considering that children are at home and mostly hooked onto social media and parents not able to supervise them at all times? I think this is a very important question, even uh, beyond COVID, even outside COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, this is a really great question. And unfortunately, I'm not the a specialist in this um, area, but what I can say is that um, online cyberbullying, cyber harassment, cyber trafficking, cyber attacks, online sexual abuse is actually more common than we think and has serious uh, both immediate and long term implications on mental, emotional, and physical well being of those affected. <clears throat> I think COVID has unfortunately created a perfect storm to increasing cyber related events uh, and online child exploitation you know, because of school closures, with young people having more access to online platforms, uh, and also with movement restrictions and social distancing causing isolation, a feeling of isolation. 
<clears throat> so I think it's first and foremost important for all of us as stakeholders who work in SRHR and gender-based violence programming to acknowledge that cyberbullying and attacks are extremely common, um, more common than we think, and in the context of COVID may be increasing uh, as young people look more to social media sites for information and for connections. <clears throat> I think countries vary on laws and regulations on handling cyber incidents, but I think what we can immediately do um, in, as service providers and stakeholders is, you know, encouraging family conversations and, and encouraging a safe space within the home to be able to raise issues and concerns, um, advising parents and guardians to be vigilant about tracking internet uses, usage of children, uh, and making helpline and hotline information readily accessible uh, to everybody and ensuring that people who call and use those hotlines know that they are usually anonymous and confidential and safe. And so that we can increase a likelihood that they will actually utilize those services. Um, I think it's also very important to do a lot of community awareness raising <clears throat> because if you're not aware that this is a problem, then people won't know to look out for it. Uh, but again, as with any gender-based violence programming, this requires a very comprehensive and holistic multi-sector approach. It cannot and should not be addressed by one organization or through a single sector. And again, as with all gender-based violence programming, we always should approach it through a survivor-centered approach uh, and adhere to the do no harm principles. Um, but again, I'm not really a specialist, but I'm sure that there's a lot of different organizations um, working on this and it would be really interesting to see um, what they're doing. Over. Uh, thank you. And I think uh, what you, you've made a very important point that first thing is to acknowledge and accept that it is very much there. Because I have found in the case of many parents that there is uh, uh, that feeling of denial. No, my child is not into it. It could be somebody else's child. So I think accepting and then dealing, and uh, as you said, it's, it has to be a combined effort, not only at organizational levels, but at family level as well. And uh, uh, accepting the problem is also the first step, important. Thank, thank you very much. We have a question from Angela Dawson for Sahlil. And uh, Angela wants to know, Sahlil, were the health professionals trained in MISP? Thank you for that question. So. For my interviews, I conducted the interviews with doctors, midwives, paramedics, and also the community health workers. Uh, the issue of MISP didn't come from the interviews of the community health workers. They didn't know a lot about MISP uh, because they felt that there, there is lack and a lack of knowledge about SRH among them, and they didn't feel properly trained on SRH. So, uh, it is, uh, we were not expecting to get uh, that kind of information from them. The doctors mentioned about MISP, but they were not uh, very well trained again. But MISP was mentioned by our key informant interviews. Uh, and this came up with the interviews while we were talking to uh, the SRH group members or the clinical supervisors or the SRH project managers. They really felt the importance of MISP and they really thought that it is very important to uh, well train the doctors on, on MISP and they should know about it. Uh, but again, the challenges were that there was tough turnover in the Rohingya refugee camps and sometimes it is very challenging for the managerial persons to properly ensure the training that should be given to the health workers. And the health workers also, man also mentioned that uh, due to security concerns and sometimes due to other challenges, they frequently change their uh, organization and they're not doing, uh, they're not working for a long time under an uh, organization. So this can, all, uh, this can also be a, a, a reason for them of not doing the, uh, the basics or the proper essentials of, of MISP. But uh, of course, our key informants Feel that it is essential and the health workers should know. And again, the paramedics didn't know about it and the health workers that are the, uh, the community health workers didn't know about MISP. Thank you. Thank you. So I think that answers Nabrisa Murphy's question also because uh, it was a similar question. And uh, uh, Raj Ratan from IPPF Bangkok 
she uh, rajratan has a question for sahlil uh, rajratan says nice study good presentation reflecting on ground reality and did you explore the aspect of safety and security of the healthcare workers in cox's bazar you mentioned thank you for that great yes thank you for that great question uh, i think during my presentation i mentioned the security concerns of the health workers uh, security was me uh, mentioned as a challenge by both the female health workers and the male health workers and when we talked about uh, talked to them about the security concerns they really thought that the context of the rohingya refugee camps are different and they feel insecure during day time sometimes during the night duty and the security concerns were more pronounced in the narratives of the female health workers and uh, they also mentioned some of the incidents that happened in the camps or around the camps uh, which would make them more conscious about their own security but the health workers were uh, saying that within the health facility there is a environment of a uh, kind of secure environment for them so they don't feel insecure within the health facilities but working in the camps itself is challenging because there is security concern thank you thank you uh, we have a question from nabrisa for manju and nabrisa wants to know that manju could you please elaborate a little more on what adolescent friendly services involved what what did you mean by adolescent friendly services what was included in that yes manju thank you shobazi thank you for the question um in relation to adolescent friendly services uh, um it's it's more about uh, introducing the you know the uh, the services that we are providing in the health facilities ensure that uh, adolescents friendly is ensured it means that uh, all the health service providers are, are trained with the uh, what the components includes in the adolescent friendly services and how they need to make sure the privacy and confidentiality and then along with that how they supposed to provide a little more time to the adolescents to make them able to express their problem so that kind of environment enabling environment uh, in relation to the health facilities that they are providing the services because of the privacy challenges uh, most of the adolescents they don't want to go to health facilities and also they don't want they will not express their problem directly with the uh, providers unless and until the providers is more equipped with the how to deal with the adolescents so it's all about uh, uh, how we can make sure the adolescents responsive services is ensured in the each health facilities and making sure that the, the service provider, providers are well aware about the uh, components of the adolescent friendly services it's more about enabling environment as a whole to to make uh, comfortable to the all the adolescents that we seek uh, for the health services there is a question from rashmi uh, for you also manju um rashmi wants you to just please tell once again what was in the dignity kit uh what what things were kept in the dignity kit if you could quickly respond to that she said she couldn't okay get okay actually the dignity kit is uh, actually um, um standardized with the 18 different kind of uh, materials mm -hmm. which is basically you know the the basic needs of the women uh, respecting their dignity basically for the hygiene related uh, materials along with the, some of the protection related materials like the uh, the the uh, church like kind of things it includes the cloth shampoo you know bath soap laundry soap you know toothbrush and toothpaste comb um chamber pot uh, uh, some some uh, solar powered flashlight and along with the you know the the sleepers the sanitary napkins diaper underwear a uh, nail clip uh, clipper along with the you know face towel and bath towel and uh, some of the cloths so cloth is actually managed along with uh, according to the you know um, uh, respecting the culture as well in the various countries so this is developed in the local basis as well so Thank hopefully you. this is uh, uh, helpful to our Thank friends uh, we have a question from rajratan from ipcf bank of for sayantan uh, rajratan wants to know considering high maternal mortality at home community level were clean delivery kits introduced and distributed among visibly pregnant women or uh, aspect of service delivery at doorstep was considered same thing yeah, thank you thank you rajaratan ji for the question actually in the initial phases uh, in the initial phase of the emergency in the mess during the mess we we did uh, 
distribute the dignity kits uh, to facilitate means to means to reduce the maternal mortality at that point of time but over the period of time as the transition has happened from this to comprehensive so multifaceted efforts have been there like specifically if we say like examples like you know involving the community health workers for improving the women health in the camps has been a, a very important key aspect of the CHW working group and the SRH working group in the sector working. And this other um, way of involving, you know, the male involvement in bringing the, you know, this is a mainly a, 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 a society where cultural norms are a bit different than what we have uh, experienced as such. So male involvement in, because the decision making for going into a facility do, do still we see that it is in the hands of the men here. So men involvement in the, you know, for the delivery services. So we, as, as Manju has referred, like, you know, we had adolescence uh, health sessions where we, we bring the uh, pregnant mother uh, with the uh, father and we do try to counsel them that what is the importance of facility uh, birth and how can we save the mother and we can ensure good, proper health, good health for both the neonate and the mother. So I think this kind of interventions were there initially in the initial phase of the emergency, but over the period of time as the transition happened, uh, we have we have you know used different types of uh, activities and the you know interventions specifically in the community level to improve this thing. Thank you, Sovaji. Thank you, Santan, and thank you for bringing this up, that involving men more uh, in such uh, processes. Because uh, very often, uh, contraception is taken to be a woman's responsibility, and men are away from it. So I think that's, that's a very good initiative. Uh, Sovaji, yes, yes, may yes. I add something? Uh, as our friend yes. Santan has added about uh, the yes. clean delivery kit. I yes. think that is the question, right? Yes. Uh, thank you, Scienton. Uh, adding to si what Scienton has mentioned, in the beginning of the crisis, only we, we distributed the clean home deli clean delivery kit uh, for the for the sake of the you know uh, making sure that the women, in case they cannot come to the health facilities, they are using that. But because in the in the beginning of the uh, onset of this uh, um, um, you know the, the crisis, the huge population came in a in a very short period of time, and that time uh, when a response was made also the mobile health camps was managed, mm -hmm. and uh, even in the camp setting the, the now what we have seen the health facilities uh, the camp has uh, uh, you know built on many health facilities now that was not the situation at the time so in in those period of time only uh, as you know uh, addressing the onset management uh, of the emergency that time only it was distributed uh, for the for the sake of the life saving services uh, wherever they are so in that perspective, that was distributed. Just want to clarify as part of the uh, yes. component of the MISP, where we ensure only the life-saving interventions at a time. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we have a question for Sigma. Uh, Sigma, who are the Majis? You referred to that uh, name in one of the, in your presentation. Who are they actually and what was their role in the study? Is Sigma there? Can you please repeat the question? My uh, connection got broke. Yes. Who are Majis? You use that word, uh, so, something told by a Maji when you were reading the... Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, sure. yes. So who yeah. are Majis and what was their role in that study? Is how were they involved with that study presentation? In that study. Yes, please. Yes. The Majis are uh, community leaders who are more as an administrative purpose. They are assigned to some blocks, they, uh, the camps are divided into smaller camps and then those are in smaller blocks and uh, under each block there's a certain number of households. And these Majis are the influential people who are, who are respected in the commun Rohingya community, they are Rohingya people. And they manage all this uh, the ration card, who will get what services, so administrative leaders that you can call. They are the Majis. Oh. And as they are important stakeholder in this Rohingya community, both the religious leaders and Majis, we included them in our uh, uh, focus group discussion and we tried to understand that what is their community perception. All right. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Samira and she thanks everyone for important presentations. 
and says that birth spacing is not under the control of women and girls, especially in difficult situations like uh, in Rohingya camps or others in such circumstances. My personal experience is that birth spacing did not work for me and abortion was not an option for me due to family compulsions. So please, could you tell us on how to make girls and women access contraceptives and other essential SRS services? Sigma, I think you can uh, say something yes, on that. Yes. I, I will elaborate on that. Definitely yes. what uh, Samir has pointed about his personal experience, also about this community where we have worked that as I mentioned, there's a very close community. The women are not the decision makers. Husbands and the mother-in-laws are the main decision maker about this uh, sexual reproductive health service uptake. They were the contraceptive choice. But what we're trying to do is if we go by what I mean by what... Maybe we have to look through this, the inroads with that, uh, the avenues we can work through that. So you have to involve these male actors, we have to involve these religious leaders, and also you have to use those kind of things that is more acceptable than the, the something that they will not uh, ready to hear. That is what uh, I try to mention about this part spacing. So there is little hope to work to that. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Sylvester for Tomoko. Uh, Sylvester is from Philippines and says that Philippines has a majority of Christian population and sex education is still considered taboo, especially in hard to reach areas where teenage pregnancy and rape cases during lockdown period had been documented. Can you suggest some doable innovative strategies to elevate SRH advocacy in these remote areas with poor digital infrastructure? Wow, that is a complex question. <laughs> That's a whole other webinar series, isn't it? Um, I, I mean, I worked in the field of SRH in countries that have conservative and religious beliefs that create certain barriers and challenges to advocating for access, um, particularly for young people and particularly for young people who are not married. Um, in one context, um, we advocated for comprehensive sexuality education as an important source of education for young people um, to learn more than it's a, more than sexuality education it's for them to be able to learn life skills you know how to have healthy relationships what are healthy gender norms um, how to learn negotiation skills so that they can enter adulthood as informed and empowered and educated individuals and in fact in the pacific where i worked before coming to bangkok comprehensive sexuality education was renamed as family life education to remove that linguistic taboo so to speak um, in another context um, where i worked the minister of health was very pronatalist and was not a huge supporter of family planning so the approach that we took was to really promote the concept of healthy families um, and to educate on, you know, healthy choices, birth spacing, and really making the linkage to from, you know, women and girls making informed decisions about their sexual and reproductive health and linking that to, um, you know, the higher rates of school completion, higher rates of entering the workforce and, you know, generating income and contributing to the economic growth of the country. Um, in another context, we use very concrete data to demonstrate how complications due to unintended pregnancies and childbirth is the highest cause of morbidity and mortality in adolescent girls. So again, making that case, um, you know, using, you know, concrete data. So I think there are various entry points and angles that can be taken, and it really depends on the context and also which partnerships that you have. Because again, the more partners you can mobilize together to speak with one voice, I think the stronger case you can make. But of course, in all of this, it's important not to forget who we're advocating for. If we're advocating for young people, adolescents and youth, it's, I think the number one priority is to engage them because you know they say nothing about us without us. You, we need to make sure that they feel empowered, that we give them the platform to raise their voice so that they can be heard, um, that they can speak for themselves and be given the opportunity to to be more involved in decision making and influencing policies. Over. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Matthias, known from Vanuatu. And Matthias says that Vanuatu and many Pacific island nations face humanitarian crisis due to extreme climate events 
and even during the pandemic we faced extreme climate uh, crisis that made things so much more difficult responding to humanitarian crisis is important but are we making sure that we are doing more on averting climate emergency tomoko would you like to say something so uh, i couldn't catch the first one but the question is are we doing more to address climate change and the impact that it has on humanitarian yes 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 right yes yes yeah climate change again is i think there was a webinar on this and it's a huge whole another topic um that really requires all levels of participation because it's not just about you know the community level advocacy and engagement but it really requires political buy in and political commitment um at the highest policy and legislation level at countries um you know because when we talk about climate change we talk about both mitigation and adaptation mitigation is when we try to offset the possible impact um you know offset carbon footprints and and do things to try to prevent climate change um effects from happening versus adaptation where we actually kind of accept that climate change is happening and try to um implement certain policies and and programs to try to adapt to those changes so it it really requires that two pronged approach and really requires kind of again a holistic um intersectoral uh approach um but it's climate change is a very very complex topic that i don't think i would do justice in just providing a very short answer over thank you would anybody else like to add something to that anybody would like to okay we have a question from simcha white from uk uh, and simcha says that despite political sensitiveness of the issue one thing that gives me hope is the enormous support in every possible way from around the world which is coming for the rohingya community and then goes on to say if this is not beyond the scope of the session can we know if there is any political progress in resolving the manifold crisis situation for rohingya people so sayantan would you like to say something to that or and maybe sigma also if 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 it is okay to share that no i think i think uh, internationally it has been uh, it, it has been uh, understood that uh, people need to uh, you know safeguard this uh, the uh, the humanitarian uh, principles as such uh, over a period of time we have seen not only rohingyas we have seen in different parts of the world this things coming up but uh, yes but as as she rightly mentioned that uh, when there is also we see this there is also ray of hope where a lot of people are also standing behind them uh, fighting for the cause so as such politically i don't know what what is the as such the updates on that but uh, yes the civil society movements have been active uh, throughout the world internationally uh, to support the cause of uh, rohingyas as such yeah i think that's yeah. what i can say right at that this point of time yeah right we don't have anybody from the government here so that that means that is you're right that the civil society response has been very good and there has been so much of work being done there uh there is a question from ak rizwan from bangladesh that there are different un agencies different ministries of governments and other partners who are playing a key role when humanitarian crisis happens and they are so are there any challenges faced in ensuring a team work in moments of crisis or have you all foreseen any challenges when different organizations and different partners are working together particularly in the context of rohingya manju would you like to say i think everybody may like to add something to that sure yeah thank you very much uh, actually uh, the humanity coordination structure has uh, uh, rightly spelled out who who will be doing what in relation to providing the services uh, comprehensive services to the growing response so uh, it's clear that you know um, there uh, under the iscg there are different sector are working like unicef is uh, uh, playing the role for the protection sector under the protection also there is the gbb sub sector is a uh, leading by unfp and under the health sector health sector is leading by who under the health sector the sars working group community health working group 
you know, that there are some working groups are there. So SI working group is lead by UNEP, whereas community health working groups lead by UNSCR. So various, uh, you know, I mean, while we are working in the, even in the pandemic, uh, we have we have come up that, you know, how, uh, you know, integrated we are working together to solve the, you know, the challenge that we have faced uh, in relation to COVID-19 along with the existing uh, Rohingya crisis. So I think uh, there is a clear uh, uh, TOR for the, all the uh, working groups and the sector. And within that uh, uh, TOR, we are, we are supporting and working in a partnership. Okay. And uh, the most importantly, the partners, like for instance, SL Working Group, there are more than 50 partners are participating every fortnightly meeting, where uh, not only the NGOs, NGOs are working, but also the older UN agencies who are a part of the other different sector. Similarly, when there is a CSW Working Group happens, so the UNAP along with the other partners are the part of the that working group. So we are working very closely in the context of the Rohingya response. Okay, thank in you. my own experiences that I'm sharing. Yeah, so I think that answers Ashish Bhadracharya's question uh, about uh, the challenges in delivering quality services uh, when so many organizations are working together. So actually united we stand, Manju, that is, that is the take home uh, message, that united we do a lot yes. many things. Yes. Yes. So I think we have already overshot the time by more than 15 minutes. So I would end up with this, uh, I'm tempted to share this comment from Roy Vardia who's regional communication advisor at UNFPA's Asia Pacific office in uh, Bangkok. And uh, just one sentence, what an important session this has been. I think it sums up all and it says a lot for the presenters. And uh, with this, we come to the close of the ninth session of APCR SHR 10 virtual. My sincere thanks to the chairperson, plenary speaker, abstract presenters, and to the audience. I would also like to thank UNFPA and IPPF for their continuous support and help to APCR SHR 10 virtual. We will now meet again on Monday, October 26 at 1 p.m. Cambodia time for the 10th APCR SHR 10 virtual session on the theme of innovations and changing norms around SRHR in Asia Pacific. Bye till then, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay connected. Bye bye. Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.